I think the temptation for Republicans uh, is in any cases with going through this five stages of grief is first going to be engaging in denial. And that's what you saw with uh, the Washington Times pieces that Carlin read today. Um, it's understandable. It's in the human response. But it would be uh, very smart for the Republicans to get farther along those stages and not stay in the denial stage very long. Because when we look at what we have to face, it is not a hopeless picture, but it is not a pretty one. Uh, Carlin's talked about the demographic changes. Uh, that is something that there is nothing that any Republican candidate <coughs> can do anything about. Even if we stopped immigration 100 percent tomorrow, which frankly no one wants to do, um, the numbers that are already baked into the citizenship cake means that the share of whites are going to continue to decline over the next 20 years as the American electorate, and the share of non-whites is going to continue to rise. Because of longevity differences between males and females, the share of women in the electorate is going to slightly rise over that period because, very frankly, as people live longer, uh, men will die at 80 and women will live to 90. So we'll have a slightly larger share of women in the electorate as well. Uh, it's really not a good idea to ignore facts. And the one fact I would like to focus on for my presentation today is a exit poll number that has not gotten a whole lot of attention, but I'm single-handedly trying to resurrect it. And uh, that is, at the end of the exit poll, the voters were asked, which of the following four qualities is most important to you in selecting a president? Romney won three of those, and he won each of those by double digits. He was the selection of the person, people who said that they most valued having a strong leader. He was the choice of the people who said they most valued somebody who had a strong vision for the country. And he was the choice of the people who said that they most valued having someone who shared their own values. The reason Mitt Romney is not president today, and I submit the reason why conservatism generally has been locked in a 50 percent ceiling nationwide since the end of the Cold War, even though sometimes we can translate that into majorities in the House, um, is because of the last group. The last group is about a fifth of the electorate, and that question is, uh, the thing that they valued most is somebody who cares about people like them, cares about people like me. Mitt Romney lost that group 81 to 18. Now, when you lose 20 percent of the electorate by 63 points, that's a problem. And it makes sense that you would do this in light of the campaign that both candidates ran, but particularly the campaign that the Obama campaign ran, which was simply a modernization of the campaign that Democrat candidates turned to in difficult times ever since the New Deal coalition won in 1932. In Canada, the Conservative Party won the most recent elections by tarnishing the leader of the Liberal Party, and in a parliamentary system that's basically akin to campaigning against the presidential candidate, Michael Ignatieff. And Michael Ignatieff was a Harvard uh, professor who was a Canadian uh, native who returned to his country to run for parliament and was the Liberal Party candidate. And the Liberal Party had dominated Canada since the Great Depression. And what they did was they systematically painted him as somebody who by his experience and his ideas was out of touch with the aspiration of the ordinary Canadian. And their, new, their television ads had a tagline that was brutal and succinct. He didn't come back for you. The Obama campaign wasn't so brutal in its overt message, but was as brutal in its covert message. The message that they decided on was essentially to say that the Romney Republican agenda, and they were always very clever in tying the man to his party, is he and they are not running for you. And they did it on the level of values for women. What was the war of women against women about? What was the contraception issue about? But to say they don't understand you, they don't care about you, they don't value you, they're not running for you. What was Bain about? What was tax cuts for the wealthy about? 
It was to talk to the blue-collar, struggling worker, white, black, Hispanic, or Asian, who struggles from paycheck to paycheck, may go through periods of uninsurance each year, to say, when it comes to the economy, they think that the uh, way is to give their friends more money and to hope that they do well by you. You don't believe that. They're not running for you. Latinos, that's what the immigration issue was about. You want to be part of the American dream? They won't even pass the DREAM Act. They're not running for you. Does anyone have any question as to why, with those series of arguments and that series of consistency that ties and interweaves into a melange that makes sense, why 21 percent of Americans who think that caring about people like them is the most important feature in the national leader, why they would select the person who was making that argument against the person who was said not to be running for them. Now, Republicans have to admit that as much as that is a caricature of Romney and as much as that is a caricature of Republicans, caricatures only work if they make sense in light of the person being caricatured. As uh, even Joseph Goebbels said, propaganda itself has to have a kernel of truth at its core. So what Republicans need to do is take a very hard look at ourselves. And Republicans need to ask, if that's how a fifth of Americans overwhelmingly perceive us, what do we need to do to change? Because Americans of all shades and sexes want a government that's on their side, that supports their values, and it's not a paternalistic thing they want. A lot of the people who voted for President Obama and voted for Democrats also answered the question, do you want a bigger government or a smaller government, on the smaller government side. What they don't believe is that the Republican Party is someone who understands that the use of government is legitimate and can be effective in giving them a hand up in American life. They don't want a hands-off society. They don't want, as President Obama said, the you're on your own society, and they don't want the handout society, the heavy hands on society that Republicans accuse Democrats of purveying. They want a hand up, they want a limited but energetic government, and the Republican Party has to recognize that that's the crucial segment of the electorate that consistently does not vote for Republicans who could vote for Republicans. I'm going to close uh, with reading from a speech that I wrote about in the National Review in uh, an article called Open Your Heart Myth. And it's what Richard Nixon said at the end of his acceptance speech for the 1968 nomination. It'll take a minute or two, but I think you'll see why I'm going to do this when I do it. He said towards the end of his speech that tonight I see the face of a child. He lives in a city. He is black or he is white. He's Mexican, Italian, Polish. None of that matters. What matters is that he's an American. That child is more important than any politician's promise. He is American. He is a poet, a scientist, a great teacher, a proud craftsman. He is everything we ever hoped to be and everything we dare to dream to be. He sleeps the sleep of childhood and he dreams the dreams of a child. And yet when he awakens, he awakens to a nightmare of poverty, neglect, and despair. He fails in school. He ends up on welfare. For him, the American system is one that feeds his stomach and starves his soul. It breaks his heart. And in the end, it may take his life on some distant battlefield. To millions of children in this rich land, that is their prospect of the future. But this is only part of the America I see. I see another child tonight. He hears the train go by, and he dreams of faraway places where he'd like to go. It seems like an impossible dream he's helped on his journey through life. A father who had to go to work before he finished the sixth grade, sacrificed everything so that his sons could go to college. A gentle Quaker mother with a passionate concern for peace who quietly wept when he went to war but understood why he had to go. A great teacher, a remarkable football coach, an inspirational manager all encouraged him on his way. A courageous wife and loyal children stood by him in victory and in defeat. And in his chosen profession of politics, first there were scores, then hundreds, then thousands, and finally millions who worked for his success. And tonight he stands before you, nominated for the President of the United States. 
You can see why I believe so deeply in the American dream. For most of us, the American Revolution has been won. The American dream has come true. And what I ask you to do tonight is to help me make that dream come true for millions to whom it's an impossible dream today. Ladies and gentlemen, when a Republican leader can read that word and read that speech without a hint of irony, with full measure of sincerity, and being able to insert the female pronoun for the male as it's appropriate, then the Republican candidate will be rewarded with the presidency, the Republican Party will be rewarded with the majority that it's sought for 80 years, and we'll see what a Republican government can do for America. Thank you. Thank you.